Um, everybody, welcome once again to uh, another new uh, photo chats. Um, I hope you enjoyed your day off two weeks ago for the 4th of July holiday. Um, I know here we had a nice neighborhood celebration and a lot of fun and got to see some family and fireworks. The neighborhood puts on its own thing of fireworks, which is pretty impressive. So didn't have to go far and it was quite relaxing, quite nice. So uh, it was pretty cool. But here we are, the 17th of uh, July, and we're very happy to have uh, Susan Mathia as our, our guest today. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, just want to let you know that the uh, next uh, photo chat will be on uh, 31st of July, and we have Dennis Keeley and Veronica Carter. Uh, information for that will be on my website in the next few days, so uh, look for an invite there. That should be fun. And we have a number of people we're talking to about uh, August and uh, September, we just got to place them in the, the right calendar slots, and I think you'll be surprised and really like some of the the, the chats that we have coming up. So uh, I know Holger and John and, and Jeff and I have all been working on talking to people, and uh, we've got enough people probably to schedule through the end of the year, just got to find blocks of time that works for everybody. So uh, your host for this, or uh, Jeff Shiwi, he was not here today. He's... Um, turned into a workshop junkie, and he's somewhere in the uh, Seattle area uh, doing a photography workshop. So uh, it's good that Jeff actually might learn how to take some pictures soon. So we're, <laughs> we wait to see how it is, and maybe we can have Jeff come on and talk a little bit about his workshop experience and all the things that he's been doing, which are pretty cool. Uh, you have myself, Kevin Raber, uh, always happy to be here. I also had the photo PXL website and Rock Hopper and all those things. John Conicello, which he is the originator of the photo chats back in the uh, pandemic days. And John, thanks for hanging Sorry, in there with us and still being part of this. Uh, some of your work that I've I seen recently is pretty damn good. I'm sorry, did I what talk over you? No, my computer just restarted as we hit it. Yeah, okay. I've been gone for a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> and then we have Holger Mischke, he's from uh, Germany. Um, he handles a lot of the graphics for us and uh, he's hosted a couple of the programs. Uh, one of our last programs was, was with Alan Ross. Uh, hold on, so I'm allowing recording. It was with Alan Ross and was quite fascinating. Alan was the uh, one of the assistants for Ansel Adams. So uh, if you get a chance, watch the recording of that, which is up on our site, as well as all the other photo chats. I just want to let you know I still have uh, workshops coming up. I've got my Greenland workshop um, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And our fine art printing workshop, which uh, we have about five people for now, so we could still use uh, two, two more, three more. We do a total of maximum eight in October. Jeff Shiwi, myself, and John Panazzo uh, from uh, Colorbyte and Image Print Software. Uh, we present uh, that it's a whole weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. You'll make lots of prints, learn all of the ins and outs of making fine art prints. I've got a giant studio at the Indianapolis Art Center where I'm an artist in residence as well as a couple printers here at home. And uh, we'll print our hearts to our heart's content and you'll find a new addiction. So if you're interested, take a look at the links on that. It's on our website. Uh, so the rules here, for, so we can have a successful meeting today. A lot of you know these at this point. We'll mute everybody here in a minute. Uh, please ask questions in the chat. Uh, John will be monitoring those and interrupting, or we'll save them to the end, depending on uh, where they fit in. Um, and afterwards, you can raise your hand or you can ask questions by unmuting yourself. And then we'll just stay online for a little while, and then the, the recording will end. So today, we're very happy to have Suzanne Mathia as our, uh, our, our guest. And uh, I've been following Suzanne for uh, seems like since I've ever been on Facebook, her photography is absolutely amazing. Her specialty is, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the Southwest, but she's traveled to all points South and North and East and West that, that there are, <laughs> and just has some amazing photography. And it's, it, it's really refreshing to, to see. Uh, I really enjoy seeing photography from a woman's perspective. I think for, I'm too structured sometime in my look. I know working with my wife, who's also a really good photographer, um, the, the feminine eye has something that I, us guys will never understand, and it really comes through in Suzanne's work. And uh, she's also a master of Lightroom and a lot of other things. So uh, we're very happy to have her here today. And uh, I'm going to uh, unshare my screen and turn it over. 
if I can figure out how to unshare my screen. Hold on. Unshare. <laughs> unshare. Did I lose? How do I? See, I told you. Yeah, something <laughs> happened. It's not like it used to be. <laughs> I know. Multiple. They moved it. Yeah, they moved it to where though? I found oh, a little I got red it. button. I got it. The There's a red button. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, they keep updating things, thinking they're making our lives easier. <laughs> That's not the way it works. All right. What I'm going to do is unmute, or I'm going to mute everybody. Most of you are muted already. And uh, then what I would ask is that Suzanne unmute yourself, obviously, so you can talk to us. And uh, away we go. So, Suzanne, take it away, and uh, we'll look forward to this. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Well, I really appreciate everybody showing up. Um, Okay, everybody's muted. Somebody should unmute. Susan, Suzanne, you need to um, unmute yourself. I was unmuted, but as soon as I went live, I got muted again. So <laughs> I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'm Suzanne Mathia, Um, and I've been following the uh, the photo chat since they uh, uh, re-arrived again and remember following them in, back in the old COVID days too. So I was really thrilled to see it. I've not known or known of uh, Kevin and Jeff, obviously, for a long time and followed John when he was with uh, creative live so you know feel like we're all 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 good friends um even though we've actually well i've met jeff but that's the only one i've actually ever met but anyway um i'm really thrilled to be asked to to do this little presentation and then i had to figure out well what am i going to do a presentation on because these guys know everything there is to know about photography so i'm not going to try and teach you the rule of thirds um but I figured my, my specialty is where I live. And uh, where I live happens to be in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, which puts me very close to Northern Arizona and the whole of the Navajo lands, Colorado Plateau area. So I thought I would concentrate uh, that on my travels around that area and my interactions with the people there, the lands, the culture, um, and just sort of a, a nice sort of overview of what's going on up in uh, uh, Navajo lands. So the Navajo Nation itself um, is one of the, it is the largest Native American tribe in the United States. It's about 27,000 uh, square miles. So it is definitely one of the largest areas and it uh, incorporates land in Arizona, um, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. And in fact, if I share my screen, so you guys can see the map, see the map. Can you guys see the map? Yes. Okay, good. Just you got, you got to make sure on this end because you never know. Um, okay, so uh, I live just south, about an, two hours south of Flagstaff. So I'd be coming up to Flagstaff here, sorry. Um, so this is the whole of the Navajo Nation right here. So you can see it goes all the way up to Lake Powell, um, all the way over to Bluff, the Four Corners, Ship Rock, down to Bistai, and then down to Church Rock, down to Gallup, and then back over to Window Rock, which is the governmental seat of the Navajo Nation, out to Grand Falls, Gray Mountain, and all the way around. In the middle here, you'll notice there's a little lighter spot and that happens to be the Hopi Reservation. And it's right in the middle, it's like a donut hole. Um, and so the, the Hopi have some beautiful coal mine canyons and you'll see some of the areas out there, Second Mesa. Um, so it takes over a whole um, amazing um, area in uh, Northern Arizona and the other states. So basically the definition of, of the, um, perimeter of the Navajo nations are designated by four mountains. So you got the San Francisco peaks in Flagstaff, Mount Taylor over in New Mexico, then up to Blanca Peak in Colorado and Hesperus Peak. And those are considered the sacred four mountains. And the um, Navajo reservation sits in the in the middle there. 
what's interesting when you do travel up to the Navajo Nation is Arizona is on standard time. We don't cel celebrate or, or honor uh, daylight savings time. The Navajo Nation does. The Hopi Nation doesn't. <laughs> Um, and then you have Utah, which is really close by, and you have the cell phone signals up in Utah. So you can be sitting in uh, up on the Navajo reservation at two o'clock. Your clock will automatically change in the middle of the night to three o'clock or one o'clock. You cross over from Hopi to Navajo, and that also changes the time too. So that makes traveling and organizing workshops and organizing tours and everything else a little difficult when we get up to the Navajo Nation, but it's a lot of fun. So I pro you've probably never seen this image before. This is a totally unique image of uh, Monument Valley. And it used to be a totally unique image of Monument Valley, but this is the famous milepost 13 made famous by Forrest Gump when he finally stopped running. Um, but it is a marvelous view and I had to include it in the beginning here because it is just such a classic view of Monument Valley. And most of my travels um, up in the Navajo area are going to be Monument Valley um, and the Canyon de Chez area, Page and Lake Powell and then some of the areas around there. So you come in from Utah and you're about 13 miles from the actual uh, Navajo Park itself. And this is the view you're greeted with. Um, so usually what happens here, especially now, because it's gotten so incredibly popular, um, is everybody darts out into the middle of the road to take their shot. And the trucks that come by think it's such a sport to try and run everybody over. Um, so we run out into the middle, try and take a shot, yell for car, run back to the side again, and that just goes on and on and on. Um, and now with the Instagram crowd, you can imagine what's going on out there now, but it's still an amazing shot. Another classic shot of Monument Valley. Let me go full screen, sorry. Another uh, classic shot of Monument Valley. This one was made famous by Ansel Adams. Um, and so you got those those two rocks there, literally in the parking lot by the hotel. Um, but it's a classic shot, a less than classic shot. So high above Monument Valley is an area called Hunts Mesa, and um, you can get up there with a with a Navajo guide and a very robust and old. Um, vehicle to get you up. I mean, you literally are driving up 45 degree angles to get over some of these rocks and over some of the slick rock up there. But you can get up there and spend the night up there and have these amazing views. And I have been fortunate to go up there numerous times in clear weather, foggy weather, snow, storms, and whoops. Whoa, whoa, did you like that? <laughs> that was quick. I don't know how that happened. Sorry. Um, and this was on a particular thunderstormy night. Um, and the sun is setting over to the to the west and just lighting up the areas here. When we start to look at some of these other images, you may recognize some of the areas that are in here. Um, down in this area here is uh, where a really good family uh, uh, live that have been my contact people there for over 15 years. And they have a Hogan and they have some farmland right down there in the valley, which is absolutely beautiful. But you're facing north here. So when you get up in the morning, you've got beautiful sunrises off to the, to, to the east and then sunsets off to the west and just watch everything change and the light change all day, which is incredible. And such a view from here too. So this is another view, um, getting close in the foreground. Um, when I'm doing my photography, I do tend to love, uh, you know, the near far look, um, sort of, I, even though I'm doing digital, it just reminds me of the old film days when we used to be able to get good old hyperfocal distance out and get, uh, get that near far focus, but it really gives a sense of depth, um, and how far you can travel visually through this image. This is uh, another image. This is sunrise from the same location. Um, and you'll notice some of these structures down here, these little towers that are coming up. 
That's called a ye the Yay Biche um, formation, and we'll see a few more images of those uh, later, but it's always interesting to see them from this different angle. But the light up there is constantly changing. Um, you can just sit there all day and just take image after image after image. And even though I've been up there probably over, almost over 30 times, um, I can always find new images, new vistas, new everything to, uh, to photograph. So changing color palette here. So this is a sunrise sunset color palette. But here on a slightly cloudy day when not much is going on and the light got relatively dull, it just gave that beautiful blue gray tone. And I was heading back to camp and fortunately my uh, camera was still slung over my shoulder. I have a tendency not to pack all my stuff away when I'm coming home because when I do see a shot like this, if it's all packed away, the laziness in me takes over and I don't stop and take the shot. So I often just have my camera um, over my shoulder on the tripod. And when I see a shot like this, I can take it. But I really love the, the difference in the color palette here. So even though I've taken the same shot three or four times here, it's completely different depending on where the light is. Now, I mentioned that uh, that. Uh, formation called Yebiche that we saw from the top. This is what it looks like from the bottom. Um, so early in the morning before sunrise, we trundle out uh, once again with a, a native guide. There's areas in Monument Valley that you can go by yourself, uh, but for sun uh, after sunset and before sunrise and in certain areas, this being one of them, you can only go there with a, a Navajo guide. And as I say, I've been working with the same family for many, many years out there. So they know exactly where we want to go, what time we want to get there, um, and the things that we want to see. So it makes it really nice. And uh, in and of themselves, the Navajo guides that we've used have become quite accomplished photographers in the process, which is really great to see. So this is another view of the what they call the totem, yay biche, at sunrise. And here is said Navajo guide um, doing a nice pose for our, our clients. Um, so we could scramble up. This is called spider arch and a spider web arch. So you can you can see why it's called that because of all the different areas. But uh, on the way down from uh, monument uh, from Hunts Mesa, we make a stop over here um, to do some photography and to just to sit in the quiet um, in the middle of the desert and look at this beautiful arch formation. And then Ray was kind enough to pose for us for the obligatory uh, posing picture, which was great. So this is once again from, from the parking lot at the hotel, uh, but we had another storm coming in, which was great. So if you get out there, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of weather coming through. And in fact, because I'm so relatively close, if I know that there's going to be a storm coming through, whether it's a thunderstorm or a snowstorm or something like that, I can get up to Monument Valley within four and a half, five hours, which is great. Um, so I'll, I'll get up there. Um, I've got all sorts of places to camp. I generally camp in the back of my uh, Toyota 4Runner. And that's always ready to go. I have all my camping gear and various weather gear and basic food supplies up in a roof rack at the top. And then all my my camping stuff is always in the back of the forerunner. So if something comes up, I can just grab my camera bag and go, which is great. Um, this is a classic shot, but I absolutely love this shot. This is a place called Pottery Arch, and you can see obviously how it's named because it looks like a, a beautiful piece of Navajo pottery. Um, usually, like I said before, I'm doing hyperfocal distance when I'm uh, composing my images and focusing my images. But my foreground here was so close and it was it was ranging from top to bottom that I actually took uh, one focus here on the foreground and then I did a hyperfocal for the rest of the image and then just combined the two. And uh, for me, it, I, it looks so much better, it, better in black and white. I uh, just enjoyed the shape and the form and the, the light and shadow of the image as opposed to having it confused with color. So here, 
um, if you look to where these this lightning strikes are, where the strikes are is actually Hunts Mesa. So had we been up there, we would have gotten struck by lightning. Um, but this time I'm down in the valley again, just looking up. And I, this was the very first image I took of multiple lighting shots. Um, I'd finally got myself a lightning trigger instead of doing it with an intervalometer and uh, managed to get this array on my on my first shot out there, which I really love. Just another sky coming in. Always interesting skies out there you can see for miles. So I found this interesting. So this was, um, um, you know, sunset. And we're just looking at the, the mittens. This is Merrick Butte over here on the right. And this is the uh, West Mitten but and the East Mitten. And then I saw these motorhomes sitting there and they almost looked like monuments themselves. So I thought that was kind of an interesting shot to sort of the juxtaposition between the natural monuments and then the, the monuments that we've decided to put there too while we're traveling. So another fun way to see Monument Valley. I've never actually been up in the balloon, but it's been fun to run around in the valley and chase the balloons around. And then you get the beautiful night skies. So this was a beautiful, this was actually right by uh, our campsite, just looking up into the rock formations and uh, just got that beautiful sliver of moon. And of course in the back areas um, off the beaten path and away from the, the tourist areas, there's a lot of um, dwellings and granaries and structures that you can see back here. So you can see up here in this alcove, this is probably a granary um, and in the areas around there, you can find tons of pottery shards. Obviously, you're not going to pick them up and take them with you. You just want to look at them and leave them. Um, but it's absolutely festooned with pottery shards all over some of these areas here to show, you know, the, the culture and the, you know, what was happening with these people when they were living there. So here's another one. Uh, it was quite a climb to get up in here. But once you're here, you can see there's there's another little granary um, up in the top um, sort of right corner area. And you can see how totally um, isolated and hidden away they are. So they would stash all their all their corn and all their goods up there and just keep them away from marauding herds and, and hordes and uh, neighboring tribes so they keep everything safe and it also keeps it cool and keeps it protected from animals and various other things too but they're absolutely marvelous to photograph so this is the same structure but looking down along the um along the wall of the of the buildings uh, of sorry of the alcove towards the building so you can see inside there a little bit and you just kind of precariously perch yourself on on the edge there with the tripod legs splayed as best you can um, to get everything uh, in focus there, which was great. Very famous teardrop arch, mandatory when you're up in the um, up in Monument Valley photographing, you have to go to teardrop arch. Um, but if you just move your camera slightly to the left or slightly to the right, you get a completely different view, which is equally as interesting. Um, you can see the, the main road here going all the way into uh, Monument Valley. Um, so obviously the weather plays, plays a part here. We can have very misty, stormy weather. We can have clouds. We can have uh, snowstorms. We can have rainstorms. So sometimes I'll be sitting there just taking photographs all day or working with clients and uh, we'll hear some tourists say, oh, isn't it a shame there's clouds or isn't it a shame it's raining or, you know, but then they don't realize what a marvelous uh, view they've got and how different it's going to be than everybody else has. So I just try and embrace all the different changes while I'm out there, whether it be clouds or bright sunshine or whatever it is. Here's another view from up top of Hunts Mesa, looking down at the uh, Yebiche. Um, and this was a, a morning we were up there and we were totally clouded in for probably about six hours. And this was about the only view we got. But nonetheless, it was still a magical, magical time up there. And we got to make some pretty amazing photographs. 
This is a, a peak called Agaltha Peak, um, and it is a volcanic plug, very similar to the uh, ones you see out in New Mexico. And then they, in fact, they follow the same line. Um, but these are a couple of volcanic plugs that are out there, which will make, make for some interesting photographs. There it is again in all its glory. And for some reason, there was a coffin there one day. I have no idea why. And I very, I, I'll say never, do selective color. But in this particular case, it just kind of worked out. The whole scene was just otherworldly and weird anyway. So it was painted red inside. And obviously you can see there was a whole bunch of uh, beer bottles and everything else. So I have no idea why the coffin was there. It hadn't been there before and it hasn't been there since. But I thought it made for just a really interesting image. And here's one of my favorites. This is a storm at Agaltha Peak. Um, and the clouds just roiled up and uh, just sit there and waited for some lightning. We managed to get this shot, which was great. So when it rains, it pours. And uh, sometimes the valley floor can be absolutely, you know, covered and pooled with water like this, which means you can get some pretty amazing reflections. And so it, it's really enjoy. It's hard to get around the valley because this mud turns into what we call buffalo snot. Literally, it's almost impossible to drive around on. Um, so you have to kind of be careful. But the reflections are are well worth seeing. So here's another area that's usually bone dry. I just had some interesting reflections. And here it is again. That's now they um, back in the day. There used to be a campground here and you could just camp wherever you wanted to camp first come first serve but of course that's all changed and a lot of construction has gone up here and now they have built little cabins and cabinets up in this area but while they were building it they were digging up a lot of the ground and when they dug up a lot of the ground when it rained we got a lot of pools of water so it made for some interesting reflections Here's some more mud tiles. You know, we all love some cracked mud. Some more wonderful cracked mud. When you're doing this and you've got a, uh, a workshop crew or got visitors with you, um, trying to get them not to step on the cracked mud is quite a challenge. So we can all take, take a, um, a, a try at shooting it, which is great. So here is an attempt. <laughs> of Monument Valley trying to be obnoxious. So twice a year, um, the mittens cast a shadow on each other. Um, it's called mitten shadow and it happens around March and September. Um, so it's quite, uh, quite the experience to see the shadow crawl up the other mitten. In this particular case, there was a hellacious windstorm. This is all wind and dust. Um, I've been camping at Monument Valley, all sealed up in my Forerunner, and get up in the morning and there's half an inch of red dust everywhere, even though all my doors and windows were closed. So that that uh, that that dust can really pile up. So there was our mitten shadow for one year. That's all we got. I don't know what just happened. Hold on. Oh, I zoomed in inadvertently. Sorry. But other years we get that so this is that same area that uh, was filled with water before that you saw um but right at uh, right at sunset the skies cleared behind us and the mitten um to the west shown its uh, shadow on the mitten to the east and we got that beautiful um shadow and then to top it off, we were lucky enough to get this reflection. So I literally was uh, laying on the ground with my chin in the mud, um, just waiting and waiting and waiting and hoping that we would get a clearing and to get the shot. Um, and I did. So I was really happy about that. So back out to Yebiche, doing a lot of near far shooting again. I love to get the... Um, you know, the, the lines, the leading lines coming in, the light and shadow, beautiful ripples on the sand dunes, uh, especially in the morning after a, a somewhat windy night. It makes for great conditions, no footprints, no nothing. Very few people actually go out here to some of these areas. So, um, you know, the, it's pretty, it's 
pretty pristine when you get out there. Early morning shot of Yebache. Another, I often turn a lot of my shots from Monument Valley and surrounding areas into black and white um, because everything is sandstone, everything is orange and red, which I love. Um, but sometimes I just want to see the light shadow shape and form. So here's a situation where my iPhone came in handy, although this isn't an iPhone, iPhone look, isn't an iPhone shot. But in order to see the composition, I had to hang over the edge of that cliff up there and hang my phone down to see if it was going to be worth doing. And unfortunately, it was. So I had to scramble around and get down underneath that alcove there and once again, splay the old tripod legs and uh, get a shot from underneath there. Nowadays, to be honest with you, with how good the iPhones are getting or, you know, the Androids, um, I would have probably just taken the iPhone shot and let it alone because uh, I shoot in RAW and I have found that uh, some of the, the quality of some of those images is spectacular and it does eliminate me having to uh, almost lose my life trying to get over some of these cliffs. Just views from the areas up there just all around. This is another view of uh, spider art. This is one of my participants up there getting the epic shot. Um, and sometimes when you're wandering around, you just find these little alcoves um, with, I'm, I'm using air quotes here, but remnants of dwellings. However much remnant there is, there's probably every time somebody comes to visit this place, which isn't often because it's well off the beaten track. But I think uh, people are just putting a few little extra little um, stones and rocks in place there. But it does make for an interesting image and you can kind of get an idea of what was going on there in times past. Yebache again. This is what I call my rule of tenths. Um, a lot of times when I'm doing vertical images, um, you know, I, it's it's all about the sky. So I keep the, uh, the horizon level way low and uh, my subject way low to just emphasize the sky and how beautiful it is out there. So sometimes when you're just wandering around, you run into people <laughs> and oftentimes we run into this person. So she, th this person that you see on the horse here with her sheep is Effie Yazi. And uh, she is one of the, one of the uh, family members that I deal with quite a bit out there and just a, just an absolutely lovely woman. But this wasn't a stage shot. She was actually rounding up her sheep. She was going to do a, a, a photography shoot with some clients over at our Hogan, but needed to come and uh, gather up the sheep first. So as we were coming over the hill, we saw her there and uh, managed to take some interesting shots of her herding her sheep. Well, there's me living on the edge. Somebody took that shot of me, but this is the sort of thing we do to get shots. This is actually out at Canyon de Chez, um, on Navajo lands, but uh, a little bit more to the south and the east. So this is the very famous spider rock at Canyon de Chez. There it is from the other angle. Um, down at the bottom there, you'll notice that structure. That's a Hogan. That's the traditional um, dwelling for the Navajo. Um, they are always built with their doors facing to the east so they can greet the morning sun. They're beautiful structures. So more of the cliff dwellings at Canyon de Chez. And in the fall, all those beautiful cottonwood leaves turn golden brown and they're absolutely gorgeous. So just outside Canyon de Chez, there's some beautiful sand dunes and uh, a lot of people don't even visit this area, but I love me a good sand dune. Um, I like the shapes and forms and the colors. So here is another rider who's out here um, with his dog over the sand dunes. One of my favorite shots of Pano. And here he is on his horse doing a little bit of trick riding for us and kicking up a bit of dirt. And there's his mom <laughs> who was busy looking in completely the opposite direction to find out where her sheep had gone. But you can see that once again, rule of tents, beautiful skies. 
Um, and this is inside a dwelling. Beautiful light coming down. Now we've moved over a little bit to an area that's called Grand Falls. Um, and this is often known as Chocolate Falls, and you can see why. Um, this can run dry 80% um, of the year, but during these times when there's heavy rains and monsoon rains, um, all the runoff comes off the reservation and comes down to these falls, which is absolutely amazing. And they're actually higher, although they don't look it here, but they're actually higher than Niagara Falls. And this is a view from the bottom of the falls. There's these little trees just tenaciously holding on as best they can. It's really a roar and a rumble down there. This is one of my favorite sort of artsy fartsy shots from, um, from, from the falls. I just love the colors. Um, you can see why now it's called Chocolate Falls and uh, the geology of the rocks there just really, and it's, if you didn't already know, um, how big these falls were, you wouldn't really quite know what you're looking at here. Um, is this a river coming through? Is this a falls? Whatever it is. And that, I just like the, the idea that you just don't really have an idea of perspective on this shot. So that's the falls from above. Um, unfortunately, uh, we can't go out there anymore uh, because it became popular as everything does. And unfortunately, the area wasn't well taken care of. So the tribe has closed it to uh, outside visitors now. Hopefully at some point they'll reopen it again, um, which I hope so. But you know, this is typical when we, when we find somewhere that's beautiful like this, uh, I hate to blame everything on the Instagrammers, but you know how they are. Um, and then it gets ruined for everybody, sadly. So you can see that beautiful sort of golden coppery glow that's coming off the rocks there, which is amazing. And then um, all that muddy water coming down. That is another view. And of course, obligatory black and white. And then this is an area called uh, Coal Mine Canyon. This is partially on the Hopi Reservation and partially on the Navajo Reservation. Um, but you can see the incredible rock formations there. Just incredible scenery. It just goes on for miles and miles and miles. Just deep canyons, multiple colors. It's really unusual terrain. Go back to Canyon du Chez, some of the cliff dwellings out there. Those are the cottonwoods finally changing color a little bit. <laughs> and this is up, believe it or not, up in Lake Powell in an alcove. So Lake Powell technically um, is on Navajo land, um, but below, I believe it's uh, 2,700 feet elevation, um, Navajo land take um, is now uh, government land. Um, so around Lake Powell, if you're at water level, you're on government land. And if you're on top, you're in, uh, in the Navajo lands. So Lake Powell is sort of claimed by both. So here's a night shot, which is fun to do over in um, Monument Valley. And this is, we're taking a little dive now over to uh, New Mexico. So this is Bistai. Um, but the night skies out here are incredibly dark and incredibly beautiful. You can see the Milky Way with your naked eye, which is unbelievable. Ooh, some more cracked mud. So this is um, a picture in one of the Hogan's. Of, this is actually Effie Yazi's daughter, um, who is uh, now uh, doing the weaving and uh, giving weaving demonstrations for people who visit the Hogan. And I just thought it was interesting fo to photograph her through the loom, uh, which is kind of neat. <laughs> Rainbows. Oh, so yeah, who, who expects this stuff one day? So I'm sitting here on top of Hunts Mesa and not only do I have this amazing rainbow come over here, this isn't the greatest photograph, but it was just the, the moment was amazing. And then all of a sudden out of the blue in the middle of nowhere, comes this whole flight formation, which was just unbelievable. I couldn't believe my eyes. 
So back to hunts again. So let's take a look at um, some of the people of Navajo lands because they are amazing. So just beautiful little faces. A lot of these were taken at the, taken at the Navajo Fair um, or the Navajo Rodeo. Some of them were taken uh, just locally with some of the families. Um, beautiful jewelry. Even though the jewelry is beautifully colorful and her dress is colorful, I just love doing these in black and white. I think they really tell a story. This is um, Andrew Henry. A uh, really famous silversmith in um, uh, Chinle. And he is in his Hogan working on uh, making another bracelet or necklace or something. And the light that's coming in up here is coming in from the hole at the top of the um, Hogan where the smoke and everything goes out. Um, but the light pattern came down and just illuminated him so beautifully that day. We got some really great shots. That's the color version. Just incredible faces, incredible hands, beautiful people. So this is another um, in uh, woman in um, Canyon du Chez and she's carding wool. So, <laughs> So this was a, a shoot that we were doing with a mother and daughter that day and daughter just about had enough. So she finally took a nap on mom's lap and I just thought that was just precious. I love that. Although this guy isn't Navajo, he was a heck of a character. He is about one of the only um, non-Navajo uh, people that are actually working up there at Canyon du Chez. Um, just, But I just thought his face was just marvelous and I had to take a portrait of him. We've seen this guy. So dancing and hoop dancing are a traditional in their culture. And what's interesting here, I didn't actually even notice this before. So this was at the Navajo Fair. And notice he's got these little raffle tickets in his hand. <laughs> Sweet. Incredible costumes. Kids being kids. Beautiful hoop dancers. I just love this moment. It's very gentle. After doing such a powerful dance. So this is the matriarch of Monument Valley. Uh, sadly, Susie passed away a few years back and nobody was really quite sure how old she was, but probably 98, 99, we think. Um, and she, she, like I said, she is the matriarch and she is Effie. Um, you saw pictures of Effie before and her granddaughter, but she's Effie's mom. Um, and she is just the most beautiful character and her we her weavings now are just worth tons. <laughs> she's a beautiful weaver, um, beautiful woman, lots of history, great stories. She'll be that's Effie, that's her daughter. <laughs> so this is out at the rodeo fair. I just love the kids and there's so little expressions. This is great. <laughs> They're ready to go. Um, uh, what do they call it? Um, mutton, mutton busting, where they, uh, they ride the little, um, the sheeps. There we go. Mutton busting. So that's their idea. That's the kids idea of rodeo, which is a lot of fun. Just wonderful faces, beautiful costumes. So the rodeo is quite the event um, and it's great to see everybody and just see all the, um, all the competition and the, the horses and the characters out there. That's Susie again, she's carding wool beautiful face. Amazing. She was always so patient with us too. You know, always happy, always smiling. I've got a lot of, lot of pictures of her where she's poking a tongue out at us just to have fun. Just to love.
So end of the day at uh, Monument Valley, these uh, some of the tour guides that do the tour for the, the regular tourists um, were just meeting. Um, I just sort of like the silhouette at sunset at the end of their little day. We just manage if you just wander around the valley, you just manage to catch people doing their thing. There's some interesting sheep in there too. I've got some pictures. I love this girl. Um, got some interesting pictures of the sheep. This is Ray. This is a guy that I've been working with out there for years and years and years. And he is the nephew of uh, Tom Phillips, who I worked with, with four years before that. Tom sadly passed away. Um, but Ray has taken over and uh, he's now my guide out there. Faces of cowboys. Hmm. Sweet little faces everywhere. But their culture is very rich. Um, and they are wonderfully warm people and will share um, share their culture and share their home and uh, with you and it's it's lovely. This is one of my favorite shots from the uh, hoop dances. So <laughs> seeing what the heck we're doing. So it's really nice to be welcomed into the inner circle of some of these uh, uh, festivities and religious festivals that they have. Um, after a while, you get to know the people and can really share it with you. Quite spectacular. So I was talking about some of the surrounding areas there. So this, whoa, I love the way it does that. So this, I'm almost done here. So this is uh, Lake Powell. Um, and as I said, Navajo lands at the top and government lands at the bottom. But anytime I'm up there in, sorry, anytime I'm up there in Northern Arizona, um, I'm usually probably gonna try and get to Lake Powell at some point or other. So these are patterns in the wake. Um, so this is just getting out on the lake and just very slowly with the uh, houseboat, just going crisscrossing across the lake and just getting some interesting patterns in the wake up there. A few abstracts, which are somewhat interesting. Very interesting. Almost looks like uh, woven gold. Then you get a different color palette completely. And this is all just reflections in the water. reflections in the water. And this is really mesmerizing. It's like looking at a lava lamp for hours on end. Um, the patterns are constantly changing. The light and color is obviously constantly changing. So I thought I'd spare you guys from the obligatory Slot Canyon shots, but um, I was able a couple of times to go out there at night with nobody else there, which was absolutely amazing. Um, so these are some a couple of night shots I took uh, out at the Slot Canyons, Antelope Canyon. Canyon. This is Upper Antelope, um, and you can see the beautiful stars. And it's incredible just to have the smallest amount of light inside the canyon there, but it just lights up the walls of the canyon, and then you can see the stars beyond. And it's incredibly cool in the canyon at night. It feels wonderful. And it's incredibly quiet, magical, very magical. It's the entrance to um, entrance to the Slot Canyon, Milky Way above. One of the very few selfies that I do, but uh, I figured I had to do the obligatory selfie with the Milky Way. And these are some interesting rock structures that are hidden in amongst some of the cliffs and the cliff areas. Um, I call this one floating strata, just because it looks like it's absolutely floating uh, in midair. It's an optical illusion. The dark area beneath it is just darker rock, but it looks like a shadow. Um, and then these are some of the fins or extrusions that come out of the rocks. 
And a lot of times when you're um, lower down in elevation, unfortunately, uh, people and tourists and everybody else that have walked over the areas have broken down these fins. Um, and I've done a whole series of images here called Terra Incognito um, because they're, it's an area that I'm, I'm keeping quiet. Some people know where it's at, but not very many people do. And we're going to keep it that way because uh, otherwise all these little fins would be broken down too. And some of these fins are absolutely so thin that you can tap them very, very lightly with your finger and they sing. You can almost see through them. Um, they're very, very delicate, but they're incredibly beautiful. Floating mountain. This is just another extrusion coming out of the rock that, that would be broken down in no time flat with footprints. But fortunately, it's saved because it's in a secret place, like wings. So that's kind of where we're, you know, we're almost at, at uh, well, it's noon my time, but uh, we're almost an hour. Anybody have any sort of questions or anything as to where we are? I'll stop sharing. That was an excellent presentation. That was pretty cool. Amazing cool. pictures. So do you go well, out, how, how often do you go out photographing? Uh, well, my schedule has changed a little bit over the last few months due, due to family stuff, but things are getting back to normal now. So I'd say normally I'm out I, all the time, every week, oh, cool. easily every week, um, especially if it's local. So I'm often up at the Grand Canyon. I'm often up at Monument Valley uh page that that whole area of uh, colorado plateau is sort of my go-to because i can say i can be up there within three or four hours it's an easy drive i can just go up there on a whim or if i see some interesting weather coming in i can pop up there very quickly too so uh, do you know uh milo fower and um, oh yeah 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 Lionel, know, milo. Big, milo and uh, little, little big thumb yes absolutely All yeah right. i've had in a fact number... uh, in fact milo uh uh, a friend of mine does a, a podcast and I recommended Milo for uh, for the podcast there. No, he's great. He's also um, uh, contributed to Arizona Highways, too, which I do a lot of work. Yeah, for, he does so. a, a lot of cool stuff. He and I are talking about doing something together. So we'll have to oh, see. yeah. Yeah. No, he is super cool. And he's well, traveling all over the world now, too. Yeah, he's all over the place. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I, one guy that I use there actually died the day I showed up, which was kind of weird. But that so wasn't Tom, was it? Yeah, it was Tom. You remember Tom? That was yeah, of course. Yeah, well, Ray, the guy that I yep. showed you, Ray is his uh, nephew. On uh, the the ride up to the um, the overlook there. Was always, oh my God! We there were times we got out of the car just to watch to make sure he. Yeah, could. yeah. I mean, so, some of my favorite f footage is is just going. You're not going to believe, you know. No. You you literally, uh, you know, you're riding along and then you come against this wall and go, OK, now what are we going to do? And they just go, OK, up we go. Well, it seemed you know? like just another day at the office for them. Yeah. But, um, no, that's, that was, I mean, um, it's, that's truly one of the most magnificent overlooks, uh, you know, and I've been to a lot of is. them uh, anywhere you, you, you could go. It just and, and if you stay there like you did overnight and get the, the sunset and the sunrise, yeah, and it's it's an experience everybody should do once at least. Yeah, no, I I agree. And as I fortunately, it's not overrun. You know, yeah. when you go up there, you usually have it to yourself, so or your small group, whatever it happens to be. Um, so it's still very unspoiled, and it's uh, it's a wonderful place to photograph. And I don't care how many times I go up there. You know, it's like getting to know an old friend. You know, you always find something new and find something different. And then what the other thing I love is sharing it with other people. When I take guests and participants for a workshop up there, uh, especially people from the East Coast who have never actually seen Milky Way with their naked eye before. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's... You know, and to, just to have them wake up in the morning and, you know, look out over that view as soon as they open up their tent. It's yeah, it's pretty dramatic and it's pretty amazing. I, yeah, I love it. Yeah, cook up a good dinner and a breakfast too. So it's yeah, just, absolutely. That's the a, good part. It's a yeah. fun experience. Um, uh, I don't want to hog all the questions, and I'll just ask this one last one, just out of curiosity. Uh, what are you doing on on printing your work? I I print my own work small because I only have a relatively small printer. So anything that's sixteen by twenty. Um, 
like the 17 by 22, but who does that? So I can do 16 by 20 or smaller. I print myself. And then uh, other than that, I have a, a few printers. I have a printer here um, in Scottsdale that's excellent called Artisan HD. Mm -hmm. And then I have um, New Mexico fine art printers that I use over in New Mexico. Cool. Do you uh, do you sell your work these days online or yep. in galleries or do you do um, shows? I don't do galleries because they take too much. Yep. Um, <laughs> I mean, I suppose if I if I could do a, a big show in a gallery, I probably would. But I've just never gone that route. Mm -hmm. So I do sell prints, but I license a lot of my work. Oh, so okay. I license a lot of my work to designers and uh, you know people doing interiors and um, you know hospitals and healthcare centers and that type of thing. And uh, that's been very lucrative. And I've done and I do a lot of very large. Um, enlargement so i do a lot of images that are 20 30 feet long um enlargements of my of my photographs cool so that's become sort of a specialty so i've got uh, wall size images uh in various places which is great fun you now one of the things that um i hear a lot of and i've seen a lot of is uh, you know 10 or 10 years ago you could go out there and you could find relative you know um be, be kind of by yourself um uh, there seems to be so many people everywhere these yeah. days do you see that uh yeah no i i do and and i i some depending on my mood i can get a bit disgruntled about it or then i can just not worry about it and just deal with it um but yeah i must admit some places that used to be quiet and used to be relatively quiet and relatively peaceful you know now when i see it just you know inundated with people who don't really seem to care about where they are they just want to photo up and go um you know that that kind of makes me sad but there's still a lot of places that you can go and get away from people lake powell being one of them and even uh you know when i go up to the canyon um i go up to the south rim and i can go to a spot that i won't see anybody for three or four days which is fabulous oh, that's so cool there's plenty of land and there's plenty of room uh you just got to find it Good. Does anybody else have any questions out there? I didn't see any in the chat. Did you, John? Oh, just comments. Um, amazing pictures, wonderful images, fantastic images. Uh, breathtaking work. Thanks. Oh, so do you, Susan, uh, so where do you think you're going to go next out out of the the state kind of thing? Um, then I'm yeah. going to, uh, yes, speaking of people, <laughs> um, well, I am going up to the canyon uh, for a couple of weeks uh, in August. That's coming up real soon. That's just a personal trip. I'm just doing that myself, trying to catch some monsoon. Um, I've been teaching so much over the last 12, 13 years that I haven't been doing a lot of my own work for a while. So I'm sort of taking advantage of a little bit of downtime to get out and do some of my own work again, which has been nice. But then I am doing a uh, private workshop um, out at Caddo Lake again. This will be the third year um, mm -hmm. in November. And I'm really looking forward to that because that's another place that there's a lot of people, but you can get away from them pretty easily. And I just find uh, just cruising through the bayou there, taking photographs is so relaxing and so peaceful. and we have a nice group and we have a couple of cabins that we sort of all just get together in and, you know, just one big happy family. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, and then I, I've got I, a, uh, Caddo a Lake, conference. by the way, Sorry. just see, no Caddo just seems to be such a hot place to go these days. And the, you know, you just amazing place. Yeah, you, it you is. You must have well, that it, one figured out. Yeah. Um, it is, it is, and it's getting very popular, but I, but don't let that deter you because like I said, it's a huge bayou and it's easy to get away from people. You know, yeah. you can go, you can go to the platform in the state park and there'll be 50 people there, but you know, you go to a little bend in the bayou and you're the only one there, which is wonderful. So, um, yeah, and it's a beautiful a place there? and beautiful people. Uh, no, actually, but we do uh, for the boats. Uh, we obviously hire uh, river guides for mm -hmm. uh, for the boats, and we uh, we uh, do a uh, pontoon and then a small boat, and then we have kayak, our own kayaks and canoes that we can use at the same time. So different ways of getting around and seeing what's what. Such a yeah, such a pretty place. And where else do you yeah. go after that? 
Well, after that, um, I don't have anything really planned yet, um, aside from just taking off, probably going to White Sands um, uh, once it cools down there a bit, because that's, as like you see, White Sands, yep. uh, my one of my favorite places to shoot, because that's just basically a blank canvas. And then I'm doing a, uh, a women's uh, conference in Estes Park, Colorado in February, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, you guys can't come. Thank you. <laughs> but it'll be amazing. Good. Now, you had mentioned working with interior designers and the like. Mm -hmm. How do you get that sort of work? Is that local? You or know, is that it's, it's, or? well, yes, it was local um, and it started somewhat organically. I believe actually the, the first connection was made uh, with my printer, uh, the artisan uh, printer that I have here in, um, uh, in Scottsdale and somebody had pr approached them and said, do you have a photographer that can do X, Y, Z and put us in touch. And then they put me in touch with them. And then that's just kind of grown organically since then, which is really great, you know, because there's no, there's no real overhead for me. Mm -hmm. I just take the image and I, you know, obviously if I'm going to do a big enlargement, I, there's some, obviously some work involved in getting it up uh, to the point that it can get sure. printed really large. Um, but, you know, as far as I am not having to pay for, gallery representation or you know printing yeah, framing, just matting, how lighting might, yeah how people might go about finding those people um that... i think i think if you were to go on um there are uh on instagram there are hashtag references to healthcare art and mm -hmm. i've noticed that those can take you to designers and okay. people who do that sort of thing so that would be a good um good idea to get started with that and reach out Great. to some of those people thank you Mm. Very cool. Uh, now, of course, you didn't mention the equipment, and you know it's it's funny that uh, all of us being gearhead junkies haven't even heard what cameras you shoot with. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm a Canon gal, um, and have been, and uh, only because I started with Canon and ended up with Canon. I've got a bunch of lenses. I've got lenses like you have uh, camera bags. So, yeah, well. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not about to give those up. So I have a, I have all, all my prior uh, cameras. I can't get rid of them for some reason. Um, but right now, primarily I'm shooting with the R5. Cool. And cool. I really, really, really like that. Yeah. yeah it's and a, I, a nice, nice camera. Yeah. Link, link, to, the go, game, link I, to the game. But they yeah, too. I didn't go mirrorless for any weight reasons because I honestly can't tell the difference, to be honest with you. But the technology in uh, in the new cameras is unbelievable. And especially I was starting to get into a little bit more wildlife shooting as opposed to just landscape and nature. And uh, the autofocus capabilities on those these new cameras, these mirrorless cameras is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah, wow. yeah, Since I really it focuses it. right on the chip and not off the mirror and you can just yeah. do so much with it. It's yeah. Yeah, it's, so it is. it's really sort of a awoken a whole new, you know, new mojo in me as far as doing the uh, wildlife stuff. Do you do much with the iPhone? I do. Um, and as I say, usually, as I mentioned, um, a lot of it, I was just doing for sketching purposes. You know, like I always take an image and kind of sketch it and see if that's something I want to take a photograph of. But then I've noticed that... Uh, my sketching shots, I couldn't recreate them with my big girl camera. Um, so there's a number of shots on my website that are actually just uh, taken with the iPhone. So I'm really starting to do that a lot more. Yeah. It, it looks like you're doing some stuff with AI or am I this machine? Oh, I, only because I have to know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, on my website, yeah, on my website, I do have some stuff that I was playing around with with AI. Um, only because if there's a technology out there, I want to know about it. So I thought I'd just sort of put my feedies in there and see what was going on. I know, and I enjoy scary. it. But I have since canceled my mid journey account. So I'm not going off the deep end with AI. But I do enjoy the uh do, do enjoy the possibilities. Um it's a double edged sword for sure. But uh it's interesting. Well what AI has brought to us, say in Lightroom with you know the masking and yeah. uh the the lens blur and you know all the different tools that yeah. they have. Um now we can get rid of noise and, you know, I think uh, my, the, I guess there's rumblings and you know, if you put your ear to the rail, 
you know, the next big one's going to be on sharpening. And of course, that's still the, 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 the challenge for a lot of people. They don't know how to sharpen. They don't understand it, even though all right. people like Well, you Jeff know, and... if, if, if Mr. Shiri was here, we could learn all about sharpening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to your heart's content. Well, that's, that's who I learned my sharpening from is, you know, capture sharpening, creative yep. sharpening and output sharpening. Yeah. He does so a lot I, of... still, I still do it the old fashioned Jeff Shiri way. Yep. Jeff, Jeff does a lot of that in our workshops, but I think, you know, that's yeah. where uh, Adobe Lightroom's next big um well, it needs to, but, you know, and it's difficult because you, you uh, one size doesn't fit all, you know, you, you can't just put sort of one recipe for sharpening on an image and expect it to work on everybody else's image because it's so individual and has to be done relatively locally, I, you know. It does. And you, but, you know, Topaz has put in, 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 you know, put together a nice, a, you know, yeah. sharpening program. We just had a hawk visit our backyard a few days ago. I'm going to try to make prints today or tomorrow. Uh, a beautiful hawk. And I shot it with both my Sony RX uh, 10 and also the, the uh, A1 with the 200 600. And they, you know, they were pretty sharp to begin with. But I, when, I, when I ran them through Topaz and did the sharpening routine, and of course, Topaz gives you the ability to you know, see four different views of what sharpening yeah. can do, uh, truly pretty. Yeah. Incredible. And then it allows you to isolate subject, and it yep. also allows you to modify um the intensity of the brush strokes yep. and you know there's a lot of control there and i i do like that i must admit i don't use it on my landscape shots but i do use it on my wildlife shots absolutely yeah, wildlife always seems to just take take i mean the difference it is needs amazing. it <laughs> yeah yeah so i think you know we're going to see some big advancements along those lines it's exciting times you know oh, it's i mean yeah. it may, to be able to do what we were doing we would have never been able to do it back in no. the, as no. they say the day I know. back in <laughs> the day <laughs> Oh my heavens! So, so does anybody else have anything they would like to contribute? I I I'm just fascinated with Suzanne's work, and that's you know has some questions, but um, want to hear from anybody else out there? Looking good. Oh, well, <laughs> good. Well, okay then. Um, I'm going to stop the recording if that's okay, and anybody wants to. Uh, add on uh, Suzanne I got to say thank you very much uh, it's oh, my pleasure, pleasure having you on board uh, I follow your work every single day visit your site oh, you know, every month great. or so Thanks. you know good it's to know. always good to see what you're doing out there and uh, I hope we can bump into each other somewhere along the line yeah I, I'm, I'm talking to Jeff about trying to do some things where we all get together uh, and get a bunch of the people we like to do some things with and get some videos done so yeah uh and, and well, kind of count like me in i'd love to be love to be included so in that. Uh, i've got your number <laughs> i know <laughs> you do <laughs> <laughs> all right well look i'm gonna stop the recording and then we'll just leave stay on for a minute if anybody else wants to um okay. say anything and uh...